it's pretty translucent. So the sun heats the bottom and you get carbon dioxide gas coming, getting sublimated on the bottom. And that gas wants to go somewhere. So it's running around between this, the surface and the ice. And it tries to propagate up to the surface through these cracks or weaknesses in the ice and blast through in, in these geysers or jets. And so we think is that these, these jets are bringing material from down below up to the surface. And then it's these, this, the winds that are blowing this material into these dark fans or blotches. And so in the spring, we see the, these, these blotches and these dark fans start to appear. And by the time there's summer and there's no ice left, they've completely disappeared. So what we think is really happening is that that dust and dirt underneath the ice sheet, you know, at the, at the surface, comes up in that, that gas that gets, you know, brought to the surface and then blown around. So when there's, and so just because the ice sheet has a little bit of dust in it, it, it changes the, where, how we're seeing it so we can see these dark fans. But once that ice sheet is gone, the material looks exactly the same as, it, as the surface. And so we think that these spiders, these fans, can tell us about the, the Martian climate and really particularly the wind. So w these can tell us as markers of which way the wind was blowing, how the wind was blowing, and as well as you know, tell us potentially how one Martian winter may have been different from another based on the properties of the ice sheet and how that gets expressed and how many fans there are and how many blotches. And we think these, these spiders, these dendritic channels, are being carved as that carbon dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide gas is running around underneath the ice sheet before it breaks through. But it seems like it takes many, many, many hundreds of years for you to make these sort of spider channels. And it's sort of a chicken versus the egg thing, which one came first. So it seems like these fans tend to come, can be associated with these, these channels, but they don't always have to. And so it's a little unclear, you know, does one really fully impact the other? But if you have a, a channels, you tend to have fans that come from them. So if you were standing on the surface, what would you see? And this is an artist's rendition. We think that they, the, these, these get jets, these geysers, probably don't go more than 100 meters high. But I still don't think I'd want to be sitting, standing on the South Pole of Mars at, on the ice sheet as it thaws. And so I think is this is a completely alien sort of process that doesn't happen on the Earth that you know, is happening on Mars. And so I think this is what I, I find special about Mars. And the idea is that there's, you know, we can learn about the climate if we monitor this. And um, you know, the interesting thing is uh, that we've been, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and I'll show you a picture in a second, has been monitoring for about four Martian years now the South Pole for these events. And the idea is that, you know, if we can compare one season to the next, so you see there's a year one image, and I tried to line up the year two image, and you can kind of see that there's a lot more fans in year two than there was in year one. And why? And so I believe there's a dust storm, so a global dust storm, where there's more dust in, the, in Mars's atmosphere between these two. And so that may be, or in, I think in between year one and, and uh, year two afterwards. So we can try to understand Mars's climate if we can, we can map these fans, how long they are, how, you know, if you don't have a fan and you have a blotch that's telling us about wind, that there wasn't any wind, how these fans change over time, you know, what happens when the wind changes? Do we see fans that are changing in direction? These are all things we want to be able to do, but as you can see, even in this small subset, there's a lot of fans. So Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is, has been orbiting Mars for a while now, for over four Martian years now. And Candy Hansen, who's PI of uh, Planet 4, she is uh, headed a seasonal monitoring campaign for the South Pole. And they're using the high-rise uh, camera um, and that has the resolution, it's the most highest resolution camera we have sent to Mars currently, and it can see about the size of a coffee table, roughly, on Mars' surface. So we're seeing boulders, we're seeing this high resolution. And so with that, you know, we can get this exquisite precision of all these fans. But that's the good thing. The bad thing is there's many, 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 many thousands and thousands and thousands of these. And so, it's, it's very hard, and it's been hard to automate this and do this with any kind of computer algorithm to say that these blotch, that's a blotch, that's a fan, 
at where is the direction and where does it ex particularly, and, and we talk, this was talked about in uh, sort of the science team live chat with uh, Mikael saying that he tried to write an algorithm to do this. It was really hard to find the start point and the end point of the fan. And human pattern recognition, again, comes through, and this is, this is easy. And so Planet 4 was launched that we could, we could finally start to map these fans and launches on the surface and really come up with the largest sort of wind measurement map for Mars. You know, you only have measurements on the surface where you are. And so mapping all these fans gets us all this climate information and gets us information about the wind that we can use to further uh, compare to models that are modeling the whole Martian atmosphere and see what they say the wind should be doing. So this is a really rich data set, and so Candy Hansen has been doing this for years, um, gathering this data and, and analyzing it. But this is the science team for Planet 4, you know, really came from the idea of, of wanting to fully study them. So I just wanted to show you our, our science team here. So Candy Hansen, who's at PSI, is uh, the principal investigator, and then there's a few other people, including me. And just to sort of bring it back into perspective is that we're having, you know, thousands of people work on this, that one of my prelim projects when I was in graduate school was to was actually doing this project on a much smaller scale but with uh, Mars Global Surveyor was another spacecraft that was orbiting Mars and so the mock camera um, took images but much lower resolution and so this actually I stole from my prelim slides um, was that I was mapping the directions and you can see I didn't map them all <laughs> because that's a lot you know lot to do and even in this, you know, we were just trying to see how the wind directions might compare to, to a global climate model that's modeling all the wind directions and, and pressure and everything, all the properties of the Martian atmosphere. And so this is a project that, you know, we, we, and Candy's been trying to do this for years to map all these fans that you can't have just one person do. And so when people, when you, if you're on Planet 4 and you're actually marking, this is something that, you know, we do too. And so this is, you know, I started with this, this data set as just a small little project, but you know, this is exactly what we, we need people to do is to mark all these because there's just so many. But, you know, that's the great thing about high rises it has so much better precision than mock that we can really start getting into a lot more detail. And so it's such a huge data set and a rich data set. And I think the response has been incredible with, with BBC Stargazing. And so I just want to talk a little bit about how we're now sort of being overwhelmed by data. There's tons of, of fans and launch markings that we now need to sort of combine to identify where they are. And I just wanted to show you sort of a quick look at the data. And here uh, you can see that um, on the sort of, I guess it is the left and will be the left for you as well, that, you know, there's these circles and, and, and crosses. And so those are the positions of the blotches and the uh, fans that have been drawn by the, our volunteers that looked at this image. And so on the right, you can sort of see the, the unadulterated image there. And so you can see pretty well the, the circles are the start points of the fans, and the red crosses are the, uh, the centers of, of the blotches, the ellipse tool. And you can see, you know, really there are clusters where there are, um, where there are sources in the image. And so we're now starting to go through and sort of figure out ways that we can um, put these to get, combine these together and identify the blotches and fans. And so that's, you know, what we're starting to do now as we're getting, yeah, as we're, we're you know, in the being overwhelmed by data stage, which is a good stage to be in. Um, and so again, you can see here in this image how well, you know, how well volunteers really, when we can combine those classifications, are finding the, the sources in the image. And so that's sort of where we are right now and working towards, you know, getting, getting combining these classifications. Um, so, uh, Mars uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter has been um, observing sort of the South Pole in this monitoring campaign for four seasons. So seasons two and three are almost done on uh, Planet Four. We went back to season one uh, because that's an interesting thing to compare season one, two, and three and see how things have changed. And as Candy has said, sort of in season two and three, they much understood better pointings and where they wanted to look. And so we wanted to start with season two and three, go to season one and then we'll be moving hopefully to season four very soon. So what are we going to do after that, right? Um, so w interesting, when I was in grad school, nobody had found any fans in the north um, at all. No f and so it was told that this was only a southern uh, feature, and they are in the north, and Hi-Res has found them. And so you can sort of see in this movie, 
Um, they're different. They're, they're definitely these fans and blotches sitting over on, on the dunes in, in the South Pole. Um, and so this is, that was just showing it played, was just a video of a, a movie of showing you when there's no ice on the surface on these dunes and then as there is ice, sort of the evolution and you're seeing these dark splotches and fans. And so the interesting thing will be how the north and these fans and blotches compared to the south, there's already evidence that they seem to be smaller. And so we're going to have a really rich data set with all this data that's coming in. So once, once we're done with the south, we're going to head to the northern hemisphere and be mapping those as well. And so with that, I'll take any questions, but just want to give you sort of a quick update of where we are and where we're headed. Okay. Thank you. Mary. Did you get that, Meg? You got to repeat, uh, Brooke, for so me. How much of Mars shows the features, mm -hmm. and do, do the rovers see them? Okay. No, this is only at the South Pole and a little bit at the North Pole. We don't have rovers there. Rovers tend to stay at mid latitudes. One, because of the, one is you want your, well, the rovers previously were solar powered, right? Curiosity now has its own, you know, plutonium powered abilities, but. So we haven't really been on the south. Uh, Mars, even Mars Polar Lander, really didn't go fully south. So this is really on the ice caps. Um, what's interesting is, in the, particularly in the south, its ice cap mainly stays uh, carbon dioxide ice on the surface and, and what they call the cryptic region. So even in the spring and early summer, there's still ice around, which is not as much of the case in the north. So it's really sort of just right at the pole in this region where there's carbon dioxide ice still around in sort of early, early summer. Cool. Other question? Yeah. Um, you could probably get uh, wind speeds and environmental data from the rovers, but not at the poles, like you said. So how do you compensate for upward pressures of the jet when calculating wind speed? That's all a lot of modeling people are trying to figure out. So there's, there's two things that I think may cancel out a bit is that one thought is that ba no high-rise image has ever caught a jet in action. So we know they can't, they, originally they thought these were like going a kilometer high. They know that can't be true because ne high-rise can take uh, stereo images and they've never, and they've done that, they've never caught uh, a, a jet in action so that we've never seen sort of a the, the material sort of lofting down. So that probably means it's, it's maybe a few hundred meters in height. So you might be able to argue just from that that it's really just the winds blowing it, but you don't have to worry as much about the, the, the jet itself. Um, and we also see that the, that the material moves. So there are some images where you can see that the fan has clearly moved directions. It was one way, and then you start seeing it's depositing another. So if you assume some kind of particle length, you can, a particle size, you can sort of estimate how much wind it would take for you to move to get the length of a fan. That's one thing they want to do is use the planet for classifications to get an estimate of sort of what, is, what might be the typical wind direction, as well as using the, the, um, the, the actual physical area of the fans to tell us some idea of how much carbon dioxide gas had to basically be there to entrain that material. Because we, you know, you know how much, we can roughly estimate how much you know, when, how much material, you, when, you know, gas pressure would need to sort of lift this material. Um, but you're right, it's, it's a very, it, it is a convolved problem. And so if the jets are doing something else, or they're higher and we miss them, that, that's together. So um, Anya, who's on our, uh, I can never pronounce the last name, but Anya, who's on the team, has been doing some modeling, has a paper or two on that, for looking at a ballistic uh, model as well as doing more sort of uh, gas flow models. But I think the other thing that'll be interesting is there, there are these global climate models for Mars that predict wind directions and speeds at the surface. And so one thing, or this is exactly what my prelim project was, run this simulation and see where, how does, do the wind directions look the right way. Um, the model wasn't working at the point and it was, Mars was losing its atmosphere, which is not good, which isn't really happening. But 
that's the idea is that there are these mar models we can compare to. And they may, they may be very similar or they may not. And so at least it might give us a constraint that they can use in their models to look at the base levels. Cool. So we'll be on the lookout for that too. Um, any other questions? I had actually a really quick question that may be very, very naive, but remember I'm a volunteer on this project. Um, do the variations that you showed before that there was a photo of one area with lots of fans and then a photo of the same area another season with fans that had changed a bit, um, did those type of variations, is it known whether they follow the solar cycle? Uh, we haven't observed Mars long enough to, to see a solar cycle. Well, no, yeah, I guess that's probably... Um, what I, so my understanding is, and again, I am a newbie of Mars <laughs> compared to, to my, uh, Anya and Mikael and, and Candy, is that what actually is an interesting thing about season one, and I believe, it's in the blog, and I'm, uh, Candy wrote a blog on this, and so she's probably say it better than I can and double check what I'm saying. I believe between season one and two and three that there's a... What, I think right before season one there was a... a dust storm oh, okay. and so, so that changes the opacity in the ice sheet and so that means when the sun hits and maybe harder for the sunlight to penetrate through and sublimate the gas so I mean, and that here to look like look at solar variations on the surface if you didn't have as much of an atmosphere and certainly no people but it looks like even the atmosphere is there right so the thing is that there's more dust in the atmosphere because the carbon dioxide is coming from the atmosphere 30 percent of Mars's atmosphere condenses out Cool. <laughs> unlike unlike the Earth, so that's re when they, that ice sheet forms. It's literally the carbon dioxide in the air condensing down into the ice sheet. So it mixes in it the, the atmospheric dust, you know, from the the red dust. So one thing is looking at ice sheet thickness. So it's all kind of correlated. So I think you might be able to look at some of these solar effects, but I don't think they're going to be as important as how thick was that ice sheet. So one of the things that Anya and Candy are really interested in with the class with the classifications is. is how do those numbers of fans and launches compare to change, or how, how you know are they correlated with the thickness of the ice sheet, which we have measurements, that we have estimates of from ground pen, from gra uh, ground penetrating radar and a couple other things. So that I think is going to be one constraint, and also how is that season one different from season two and three? How did that dust storm change things? Cool. All right. Well, thank you, Meg. Let's all thank Meg again. Mm -hmm.